Git is a version control system to help teams collaborate with each other and be able to contribute to a singular code base. But let's sit back a second and look at why Git was invented in the first place to help solve the problem of version control software. Version control is an essential part of any development team, making sure that you can roll back to previous versions in case there's a problem, as well as being able to track change over time. However, while this sounds simple, it's very complex and challenging under the hood. At the time, there were a bunch of existing solutions that existed, but all of them had constraints, whether that was performance-wise or they were difficult to use. This is where Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux, had just had enough with the existing solutions and decided to create his own one called Git. Ever since then, Git has just grown in popularity and now almost every software development team uses it across the world. So let's have a look at what Git is and what do we need to know to be able to get started and start version controlling our code. I've got a simple project here that's just got uh, two files and a folder with a virtual environment in here. Now, what we're gonna do is use Git here to uh, enable us to version control this. Now, the first concept to understand with Git is a repository, which is effectively the folder that's going to store all of your projects and you want to version control. And so we can create a repository by simply typing git in it in the terminal. And just like that, we now have a git repository. We can now use something like git status to tell us what's going on. Now this is where the next key concept comes in, which is a commit. And you can think of a commit like a stamp in time. It's where you're going to create a stamp of the repository at that point with a unique hash, which means that you can go back in time and view any changes made before or after that point in time. Now, because our repository doesn't have any git commits, and we can see that by typing git log, we can see that it doesn't have any, uh, we don't have any history, but we can create a commit and then add that to our repository. But it's worth noting, just because we want to create a stamp in time doesn't necessarily mean we want to do it for every single file in our repository. If you're using something like Python where you might be generating a bunch of files such as in a virtual environment or cache files, those will constantly change, but also those are the sort of things that you don't wanna go back in time and see previous versions of. They are something that you will generate at runtime and only use for that singular execution. So as far as we're concerned, we don't wanna store it, especially because it's huge, it changes regularly, and it's gonna blow our repository, where the main thing we're looking to track is the Python code. So what we can do is create a file here called the git ignore. And this git ignore file will now tell the repository, pretend these don't exist. And so I can simply just type in uh, the name of our virtual environment, VM. And now if I type git status, we'll see that it's going to completely ignore it. Whereas previously when we did git status, we saw that there too. This is a great way for making sure that you don't commit things like your environment variables that contain any secrets, as well as any other sensitive data. Now to create our commit, we first need to add it to the stage. Basically, we need to go, these are the things we want to add to our commit. So I can type git add and then dot. And now if I type git status, we'll see that it's saying that these changes are ready to commit. And I've now got an another opportunity to maybe remove any of those files or um, modify and add any others that I may have missed. Now we can finally make our commit. And this is where I can say, uh, initial commit as my message. So when we look back, we can understand why I made this commit. What does this stamp in time represent? This is the start of our repository. So now when I make the commit, we can see it's going to create a hash. And when I press git log, we can see we now have from myself, Will, uh, we have the initial commit and we can see the hash for it too, which is fantastic. And so now I can go back in time and I can see exactly what the repository looked like at this point in time. Now, where Git is really, really clever is where you can work with multiple people. You've probably had it where you're all trying to write in the same document at the same time. You end up writing over each other or someone moves a paragraph down and it becomes a nightmare. And this only gets worse when writing code because all it takes is someone to add a new block of code in. And now all of a sudden you are unable to test your code because there is some unfinished code in the same file. Now, Git allows you to create things called branches, which are effectively complete mirror copies 
of your project that allow you to make separate changes and then later you can come back and merge them together once you're happy, which means everyone can have their own unique copy, they can do the changes they need and then you can merge them all together normally into what is called a main branch, uh, which is typically the branch of the working version, maybe that's your website that's actually live in production, that sort of thing. So with that, let's make a change to our Python code now. And in order to make that change, we'll do it in a new separate branch to make sure that our main branch, the one that we're currently in, which I can do by checking with git branch, doesn't break and we can spend time changing what we're doing, make those commits so that even if we haven't got it fully working, we're still making regular versions of our code so that if we need to go back in time or maybe we've gone down a rabbit hole too far and we need to take a few steps back, all of the history is there for us to use. To create a new branch, I can do git checkout dash B and then I can just type in the name of my branch. I'm just gonna call this feature. And so now it's switched me to a new branch and now I can make changes here to my Python file that will be unrelated to that main branch. So now what I can do is just simply add in a, a quick log message just to show how this works. And just like that, as you can see here, I can now do a git status. I can now make a commit here. So now if I do git log, we'll see that I have two commits here. I have a hello world commit and an initial commit. But if I go back to our main branch, you'll see that immediately that extra line we added disappears, which means we've got two complete versions of the code, but they are separate, which allows us to experiment without accidentally wrecking what was already working. But we finished our branch and we're now ready to merge that in. So what we can do now is merge that branch into our main branch. To simply merge that in, we just need to type git merge and the name of the branch that we want to merge from and then we'll merge it into the one we're currently in. So we're in main, which is the branch that we want the code to end up in and we wanna take it from our feature branch. So I'm gonna type in feature like so. And now we can see that if I type git log, main is now got the same history as our feature branch. And you could say that they're both now at the same point in time. So this is very, very useful if you've got multiple people working on features across a large code base, but you wanna make sure that those features are ready to go before they end up in your main branch, which might be in production. Now, the last thing for us to do is to add a remote repository somewhere in the cloud that we can store our code so that when everyone is collaborating, they will work on their local repositories on their laptop or their system, but then they'll push their changes to an origin. In this case, we're gonna use GitHub to store our code. So everyone will have their code synchronized with GitHub, which will be sort of a central point. So let's now, so let's now head over to GitHub and create a new repository. I can simply just call my repository git 101 and then I'm just gonna press create repository. Now to be able to connect these two, we need to use something called a remote, which basically tells our local repository, this is where you're gonna send the code so that it's stored in a remote location. We can take our URL like so, and then when I go back, I can simply do git remote add, and then we're going to call our remote uh, origin and then I can paste it in like so. So now, if I was to do git push uh, dash u origin main, what I'm doing here is now pushing all of the commits in our local repository, and I'm going to reflect that in the, the one on GitHub. So now when I do this, we'll see the origin will get updated. And if I give this a refresh, we can see all of those files that we previously had in our local repository now in GitHub. And this is the same for any branch. We can push other branches. So if I wanted, we can go back to our feature branch and I can also push this one. So now if we go to GitHub, we'll see that we'll have two branches. We'll have the main one and the feature one, and we can see that they are both up to date and they're at the same point in time. This is where we can take Git one step further to help us with automations. Now we've got our code here stored in GitHub and using the main branch, we can rely that this is a production ready version of the file. So we know that main.py is ready to be run in production. Now using something like Kestra, we can actually clone that repository and then run the code every single time we want to run that Python script, which means we're always getting the most up-to-date version regardless of what changes have been made, which means if we run this every day at 2 a.m., 
any changes that have been made and been published to the main branch will be used in the next iteration without you having to go and manually log into the server, pull the changes, and then hope it works. Here, what we can see is it's gonna use the git clone task here to clone the repository, and then it's going to simply call our Python file. So now if I press execute, we'll see this will work in action, and we could add a schedule if we wanted to later to be able to have this run automatically. And just like that, we can see that it's put out both the number of stars, but also the hello world message that we had in the Python code. We can just set this up with a schedule so it runs every day without now having to manually run this or check in on it. We can take that one step further as well. Not only is it important to be able to pull your code to Kestra so that you can run it automatically, but you also might want to version control the flows and any files that you generate inside of Kestra back to that repository. And so what we can see here, we're using the push flows task and the push namespace files task here so we can keep all of the things inside of Kestra version controlled so that if we do need to roll back like we do with our code, we can do that too. This is set up on a routine to run once an hour at 15 minutes past. So this gives you the flexibility now to make sure not only is your code version controlled, but your workflows are too. Git enables collaboration across teams super simple, meaning that teams can focus on what's important, which is focusing on working on their code rather than having to try and integrate all their code together. Hopefully this has given you a bit of an insight in both how to get started with Git as well as GitHub, but also how you can automate that using something like Kestra. If you're curious to learn more about Kestra, I'd recommend checking out the video here that will give you a four minute overview of how you can orchestrate and automate more things such as Python.